Good morning. How are you this morning? I know, an hour's less sleep. Did you remember to put your clocks forward last night? At least this year, I mean, there have got to be some positives with lockdown, haven't there? But at least this year, it does mean that nobody's turning up an hour late to church and going, oh, have we started already <laughs> then? Uh, but it's good to have the opportunity just to share a little bit with you again this morning. And inevitably, of course, it's Palm Sunday, so... Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. The crowds go wild, climbing trees, pulling down branches, throwing their coats out into the road to make the path smooth and soft for him to enter Jerusalem on a great triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And it must have been an amazing day, wouldn't it? And of course, it's a familiar theme that we would talk about on Palm Sunday, the idea that the crowds recognized Jesus for who he was. They recognized the prophecy that was around him. They recognized that he was the Messiah. And that sense of God working in their lives, that sense of the fulfillment of prophecy, it prompted hosannas to come to their lips, for praise to be proclaimed, for adulation to be given to Jesus. And as I say, it's a familiar theme for Palm Sunday. But actually, the idea of unrestrained adulation, you find it throughout the Bible. People just overflowing with worship and praise to God. You find songs of praise proclaimed for what God has done. Dancing and celebration because of who he is. And if you look through Old Testament and into the New Testament and into Revelation and what's going to come when it all comes to an end, you see this unrestrained worship, unrestrained adulation. Whether it's David dancing before the Ark of the Covenant and his wife looking down her nose at him. Whether it's the angels filling the skies with songs of praise as the shepherds stare in amazement at what they've been told. Whether it's Simeon seeing the baby in the temple and regardless of everybody else who's around him bursting into song. Whether it's Elizabeth and the unborn John the Baptist recognizing that the Holy Spirit is moving on Mary and that God is accomplishing his plan in the world it says and the baby in her womb John the Baptist in her womb leapt leapt even the unborn child was able to worship and praise and as I said the experience then of Palm Sunday should perhaps be no surprise to us that people were so consumed with what God was doing, so consumed with the idea that the tyrannical rule of the Romans would be broken and they would be set free because the Messiah was come, so consumed that prophecies that had been given hundreds of years before appeared to be being fulfilled in front of them. It's no great surprise that the crowds went wild, that they just wanted to express themselves with some outward show of how grateful they were to God. And it struck me this week how seldom, as followers of Jesus, how seldom we get carried away with the presence of God. You go to a pop concert so they're still called pop concert you go to a gig and people go wild for the music you go to a sporting event football or rugby or tiddlywinks and people go mad in celebration because their team wins or seems to have a smidgen of success and yet When it comes to worshipping God and grasping the wonder of his love, we're so reserved, aren't we? 
Now, that's partly our culture. It's partly our nature, although the gigs and the football matches would suggest we have the capacity in our culture for more. And I'm certainly not suggesting for a moment that we should all go out and start climbing trees and pulling branches down. That would be totally inappropriate. But I wonder if we are willing enough, open enough, desirous enough to be, as the hymn writer says, lost in wonder, love and praise. I wonder if there is within us an understanding of the greatness of what God has done to such an extent that we are willing to give ourselves to extravagant worship. Are you actually willing and do you actually want to give yourself to the worship that God deserves? To allow ourselves to become excited at the thought of him, rather than it all being a bit familiar, a bit jaded perhaps, being a bit blasé about it. And I was thinking about this sort of stuff this week, and it led me to think about Miriam. Miriam was Moses' sister, and in Exodus 15, verses 20 and 21, the people have just come through the Red Sea. The waters have parted. They've come through. Pharaoh and his armies have been destroyed. And they get to the other side. And she is so consumed with gratitude and with praise that she can't hold it in. The people had been enslaved. God had sent Moses to deliver them. Pharaoh had given chase across the desert The waters had parted and deliverance had come. God had intervened for his people. I mean, it wasn't so good for Pharaoh and his armies, was it? And I often think, you know, possibly one of the first examples of squaddies being sacrificed at the whim of politicians, that one. Because Pharaoh could have just let them go, but oh no, his pride was offended. He had to chase them down. Anyway. God intervened. God intervened. And Miriam. And the Bible tells us not only was she Moses' sister, but that she was also a prophetess. Now let's be honest, Miriam barely gets a mention in the story of Exodus. When we tell the story of the deliverance of the people, it's all Moses and Aaron, isn't it? And, and, but you know, she was the one that watched over him when he was a baby in the bulrushes. She was the one that went and got his mam to come and look after him when um, Pharaoh's daughter was looking a nurse for him. And I kind of suspect that she had a bit of a stronger character than we always give her, necessarily give her credit for. But they came through the Red Sea. The waters crashed in behind them and they were delivered safe to the other shore. And everybody's standing around and Moses is praying and giving thanks and she's just overcome with gratitude and she picks up a tambourine a timbrel and along with some of the other women they dance and they sing before God in adoration for what he has done they got it you see Their people had no hope. Their people were lost. Their people were condemned. Their people were set to be sacrificed on the whim of of Pharaoh. And God delivered them. And with total abandon and no inhibitions, she gives herself in loving praise to God. Friday is Good Friday, the day that Jesus died for you. Sunday is Resurrection Day, when the power of sin to condemn us and hold us to a lost eternity was broken. The day when he led free 
those who were enslaved to sin. The day when he led free those who were condemned to hell if they would put their faith and their trust in him. The metaphorical waters that stood between us and the promise of eternity were parted by his death and his resurrection and we were set free so that we could move into what God had for us. And the forces that would drag us back their power to take hold of us was washed away by his miracle and his sacrifice. And I wonder how grateful we are. I wonder how often we stop and think about the magnitude of that. I wonder how often we find ourselves consumed with adoration and praise for what the Lord has done. I wonder if perhaps this week we need to seek a place of more active gratitude. I wonder if this week as we prepare for Easter we need to give ourselves each day to the excitement of being a child of God. I wonder if we need to take time each day this week to put on a song, to lift up your hands, to lose yourself in the wonder of what God has given for you and celebrate His great love. doesn't matter what the song is. It can be contemporary or it could be traditional. But the point is, let's find a place to give ourselves to God. And whether we do it with excitement or do we, do we do it with quiet reflection, Every day this week, make time to stop and think about what the Lord has done and lose yourself for a few moments in adoration before him. Forgive us, Lord, that so often we take for granted your great love. Forgive us that we get so used to and familiar with the idea that you sacrificed yourself for us. Forgive us that we get so complacent about the fact that in rising from the dead, you broke the power of sin and guilt and shame over our lives and set us free to inherit a great eternal inheritance in you. Forgive us that we take that for granted and we get used to it. And help us this week to find a place of unrestrained adulation. Deep and genuine praise. Consuming gratitude for all that you have done. Hosanna to you, son of David this Palm Sunday. Amen.